the other branch, you said? William Burris. William's the employee, and uh, and then Ada is, is on the board. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, you remember us being here before, right? Hello. Here. This is a little nicer room than where we were last. Year. Hi again. Hi. How are you? Very well. Hello. 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 Who's running this meeting? Marianne is the chair of. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's no. no, you, you. I'll say that. Yeah. You're all <laughs> set, you can tell. <laughs> that was easy. Oh, that one, Carol. Okay. You always ran them before. What are you looking at me now? You're doing, you're doing a great job. Okay. So um, I'm going to open the meeting on the Community Development Block Grant Program, and um, we're starting our interviews, and we have Casa Latina, and we have Lillian Torres. I am. That is here in Anada, right? Anada Garcia, Lillian Torres. Okay, yeah. and yeah. thank you. Sure. And I also want to remind everybody that we are being videoed and recorded by mm -hmm. the North Street Association. Okay. And I forgot your name cards. Oh. Uh oh. I'm I'm Bill Dwight, City Councilor Bill Dwight, and Councilor at Large, and Council okay, President. City Councilor Jean Casey, Ward Seven. City Councilor Maria Large, Ward Six. And I'm Carol Reinhardt, I'm a co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. There's Ed Keller. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Very formal meeting. And our technical support is Ruth. Ruth McGrath. Hi. 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 <laughs> okay. This is an ongoing project, mm -hmm. which you come back to us every year to get funded. And you are asking for a request of $20,000. And I do know the last time that I had talked to you, Annette, that apparently there was some problems with the program as far as the funding. Do you want to talk about that to let us know how you're doing with it and talk about the program in general? Yes, actually today I am here as a member of the board, not as co-director anymore. Uh, since uh, January 12th was the last day for me in Casa Latina. So Lillian is the only staff right now. Uh, we are uh, working with the volunteers, of course, and uh, I think that what is helping us more is that uh, we have had Elizabeth Jimenez, who is a, a resident of Northampton. She has been, she was uh, in Casa Latina for many years, uh, you know, for months. For a few years, but a few months every year, mm -hmm. working, uh, uh, doing the community hours. From uh, she came from the Department of uh, Transitional yes. Assistance, and she has uh, done a lot of work for us in the past. And right now, she's interpreter for Casa Latina, but at the same time, she's covering uh, community hours because she's not getting enough money through the interpretations to to be independent. So she's covering right now. She's doing twenty hours. Yeah. 20 hours a week. Uh, so when Lillian is, you know, she, when Lillian has to go out, uh, she's the person who covers uh, the office. And we have other volunteers that come to the office uh, to cover, uh, you know, when she's in the, in the meeting or, you know, she's out for any reason. So that is what is happening right now. We have just one person in Casa Latina. We continue uh, getting the support from United Way. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a small contract with uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital to cover the interpretations that they uh, can't cover. Uh, and uh, we have a small contract with Highland Valley Elder Services to do some information and referral with, for the elders. We have a small uh, amount of money that is coming from Community Foundation and a Women's Fund to develop a, a program that is running now. It's got, in the, in the process to start actually at the end of this month. 
Uh, so that is what is happening. Nothing has changed since the last time that we met, just that I am not there anymore because the income that comes to Casa Latina right now uh, is to cover the basic, you know, the expenses that we have, like rent, uh, you know, telephone, so and, and so. uh, Lillian's salary. So where are you now? Well, a miracle, you know, <laughs> miracles happen. <laughs> I actually had the opportunity to move to the Department of Public Health. I, uh, around October to November, I applied for a care coordinator position uh, to work with children with health care needs. And I had the opportunity to get the job. And I am a care coordinator for the Department of Public Health. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I you. You're right at service center? Yes. Okay. I was looking at your chart, something about you do 700 door-to-door -door going into Seagrass. Yeah, but they included uh, everywhere. They, I think mm -hmm. that when they, I haven't, I haven't gone over this proposal. <coughs> my, my last month, they uh -huh. have been like, <laughs> you have no idea. So this transition hasn't been like yeah. uh, But uh, it seems that they, they included the whole uh, oh, Hampshire yeah. County. Hampshire okay. County, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we think that probably we are serving uh, around 305 people, mm -hmm. you know, in this area, individuals. That's okay. quite good. Mm -hmm. In so, North Hampshire and Florence, yes. Yeah. When you say nothing has changed, um, since last year, the mission stays all still the same. You don't have anything that you're doing differently than you've been doing over the years. No, no. nothing has changed. And, and the reality is that the reason that it's not going to change is because the work that we have been doing is the work that is needed from the community. You know, and I, when I was coming here, I was thinking that, uh, and I want to let Lillian to talk because no, I don't no, know how to talk a lot. I, you know, I <laughs> should stop talking and, you know, it's okay because she has more experience with this than me. That I think that is my first time here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking when I was coming here that uh, you know when when we went through this process, uh, we started to talk about this uh, to the people in the community when we had the meeting. Uh, you know, uh, not so Casa Latina, but I had the meeting with with all of you yeah. and. Uh, you saw, you know, the, the reaction of the people when we talked a little bit about, you know, the changes. And then the reencuentro, when we had the reencuentro, that is a meeting that we have every year, it, it, we again talked to the people that came to the reencuentro. We had more than 80, 80 people there, like yeah. 100 people mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were like, you know, they didn't want to think about it. You know, the idea, the idea that I was living, that I didn't was the only person who was going to stay there because they thought, this is coming, you know, down, down, that probably this is going to come to the end. And and people started to call Casa Latina and talk to Lillian and say, you know, what's going to happen if you are not there anymore? What's going to happen? And we try to, to bring the message, you know, the best way, you know, saying, you know, we are going to continue doing the work. It's just that now what is going to happen, and they, you know, they, they have been so good. You know, we said, now you need to call. We can have walk-ins. You need to call to the office and get yeah. an appointment to complete documentation because that takes time, mm -hmm. and the person in the office is, you know, answering the phone at the same time. So we need to do that, and, and people are, you know, There's great. Yeah. If they call and they say, "I'm gonna go," no, 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 no. you can't come. Yeah. You know, I, I am available these yeah. days, mm -hmm. and and tell me when you can come. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been a little bit hard because uh, we cover, you know. Hampshire County, of course, the people that we serve is more in Florence, Northampton, and Amherst. Mm -hmm. But Lillian uh, has gone to Amherst for the last five years or six, every Tuesday afternoon. Amherst is not giving us any support to do this. But we see the need to, to be there, you know, because the people that we serve in that area, they don't have transportation to come to Northampton. If they have transportation, it takes a lot to come to Florence from mm -hmm. different places in, Af in Amherst. So it's, it's like, a, you know, it has, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated, you know, because then we, we have to think, okay, what is going to happen with Lillian? We should continue going to, to, to Amherst or we should stop that or what? We have decided that Lillian should be there. You know, it's our community. We have to continue doing the work. 
and it's working up to now because people now they they know that the office probably Elizabeth is going to be there or probably it's going to be closed but that is you know what we can do and people you know are processing that and they are responding to that and uh, so of course it's hard it's not easy it's getting harder and harder but the work is being done mm -hmm. so in, in last year we talked about the door-to-door -door visits, the, that was the biggest part of your outreach, is that? Mm -hmm. So, do you find that you still, even though you've been around for so long, do you find that you still have to do the door-to-door -door as aggressively that, as you've been That is going to be one of the, the situations here. If we don't get, and we know very clear what, you know, what's mm -hmm. the situation with the, with the funds. We know, you know, yeah. the, the communication is clear, you have said very clear you know, when you have lost a fund, and we know we ask for that money because if you give it to us, we're gonna be happy. If not, <laughs> that's the way to go. You know, you we're gonna get what we're gonna get. Whatever you give us, we are yeah. gonna do. You know, whatever we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have been thinking that probably it's not going to be as intensive. You know, yeah. because the office has to be open, yeah. mm -hmm. and and when we send someone out, we develop relationships so when we know the people we know that we can go and but there are some places that we can't just one person can't go you know we have areas that we like to go two people yeah and when we have new people in the community normally we we go you know together to visit so that means that we don't have the same opportunity that we have before just to you know leave someone in the office and we go now now who is going to go so you still have the same amount of volunteers and things such as that or or none? No, we, we, you know, people are good. A lot of volunteers. Yeah, though. people, you know, yeah. we have yeah. been able to develop all of these activities because of volunteers. Exactly. Yeah. And right now, for example, I receive continuously a call for the our resident. You need help, Lillian, please call me, not only for the resident, for example, the service, um, um, no, they're here. Safe passage. Safe passage. Uh, the person there call me and say the same. If you need something, please call me. And uh, I have a lot of uh, resident or on um, the person to bring to us the volunteer work. I have it. Yeah. yeah. So Amherst isn't giving you any support. <laughs> yeah, no. And and yeah. and this is the. You, and have, have you, you asked? Mm -hmm. oh. oh, okay, yes. Okay. Do you apply for? Through the CVG money, for so different, CVG? yeah. And, Since and you, ever. We got, we got some funds probably like six years ago mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years, and then oh, so many things, and we you know, we have gone to, you know, talk about it. Yeah. And, so, when, I mean, when you apply to them, you're also mentioning that, that Northampton is supporting you with uh, CVG funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't embarrass them enough. Probably, probably it does, but yeah. it, that doesn't change. That's not quite enough, right? <laughs> yeah. And I know, I know that. <laughs> That's right. We are being the, recorded. The Amherst CDBG, the process is totally different. Too. Right. Totally different. Right. Totally different. Now, it's from the fire station. Oh, yeah, it's a tone. <laughs> I thought it was your dog. Uh, in the paper last year about Norris. I didn't say what? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't read that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Touch on that a little bit. With the authority of the Federal Communications Commission. Fireline Touch Limit Station 2. We're all set. Okay. They don't get it. Station 2 loud and clear. Fireline Touch Limit Duty Officer. They don't get it regularly like we do. Right. They're not an entitlement community. Right. Right. We get it from the feds. They have to go through the state. So depending on how their formula with people below poverty, income rates and all that, sometimes they're eligible and sometimes they aren't. But they have been over the last few years. But um, they tend to give a smaller number of grants for larger amounts of money. And I don't know if it's a staff capacity issue, but like for interest, for instance, they give they were given like a hundred thousand dollars to the Amherst shelter out of right. CDBG mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And then I think Big Brothers Big Sisters. There was only like four. Yeah. Like, yeah. They always they only, they only fund a few. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we had asked that last year also about whether Amherst was 
I mean, there was nothing. I don't know what you got last year from Amherst. No, no, no. From no. Amherst, we haven't gotten nothing, anything for the last nothing. five years or maybe more. more. Do you, five or six years. Do you serve people in Hadley? Yes. Not no. a lot of people. Not a no, lot, right. but no. in Hadley, South Hadley. Um, but just, you know, yeah. Yeah. a poco. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the group of people that we serve really is in it's Northampton, Florence, Amherst. Amherst. And then a few in East Hampton, a few in South Hadley, mm -hmm. Hadley, a Belcher Town, Belcher Town. You know, right. but not, not too many from mm -hmm. where. You go as far as Belcher Town? Yes. Right. Yeah. We have gone to where? To where? Yeah. Greenfield. Yeah, but Greenfield is another story. I don't though. understand yeah. how many yeah. other channels. I didn't realize you went over to Belgium. Why are we supporting yes. all these other channels? Well, we're not. Well, we're not. We're, we're supporting an agency. Yeah, that I base. understand that. But, but they're, I think they're basically. That these other agencies well, should they, be stepping in these other well, channels. Other communities, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think that. Um, That's unfair. I think that the numbers are not high. Well, in numbers they are. Right. But yeah. we know the reality. Exactly. You know? right. And we have had so many conversations. Mm hmm. And you know, yes, yeah, 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 we have the work that we are doing, but nothing. But we have a very large Latino population here in Northampton. Yes. Well, we, and it's growing. It's, it's growing. It's growing. Growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. It's Yeah, the Amherst Latino community is roughly the same as Northampton's Latino community, it could be, right? I mean, so they, they, yeah, sometimes we, you know, it goes up. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that is half and a half. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, the. Amherst, part of Amherst assessment happens to be the, the, the 30,000 students that are on their campus as well, right? Oh. Isn't that, they, they, they're considered in their, in the income arc, the fact that you have basically close to 29,000, let's say, people who aren't even employed, who aren't making money, who are actually, so Amherst assessment is skewed by its student population. It would seem to me that they would be getting, uh, I know at least traditionally with lottery funds, they've done quite well. And that, that based on that formula, they, do we know their HUD assignment is proportionally same, skewed the same way? Or is it? I don't know how it works there. I mean, I'm thinking the fact that it includes UMass would give yeah. them more money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't hurt them, it would help them. Yeah, yeah. the spreadsheet tells you that. Um, they're down to about fourteen thousand dollars per capita, and they're taking the students into right. play. So there's really, it, 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 it's it's very difficult to figure out uh, on the DOR's website just exactly where they're at. Mm -hmm. Well, the, very tough. the reason I ask that is, it seems to me that Amherst may actually have more money for an under, and I don't know this for a fact. I'm just guessing at this point for block grant assignments. It seems to me they do get more than we do. They do. And for whatever reason, they just choose to fund right, a smaller group. And, and mm -hmm. they, they, the way that they present, a, you know, every, every time their proposal comes out, it's very frustrating because they, it's like they are telling you, apply, but yeah. don't lose your time applying because you're not going to get anything. Yeah. That is the message <laughs> you <laughs> Yeah. 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 Because we already have gone through the yeah. meetings and we know who is going to get the money and for what, you know. It's, you yeah. know so it's like... We, we applied for it for a few years in a row, and then we decided that we were paying a lot of money to the person who was completing the application, and it didn't make sense, because anyway, when we got the support from them, it was a, around $5,000. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the time that she was there, for transport, you know, transportation, and her, it was good. But uh, How long ago was that, do you remember? Oh, my God, I think that it was probably, it was a little bit more than six, probably seven Eight to seven, yeah. and then we applied for a few years in a row, and yeah. then we decided not decided to do it anymore. Yeah. yeah. For the last years, we haven't applied because no. we received the, the proposal, and when we go through the information, we say, no, you know, it doesn't make sense. Because it's very hard to apply for in the CDBG money to America. <laughs> because, say, for, um, okay, you received the, the information, say, okay. Help to us to why divide this money to, but this money is through this, through this, through this. I right. say, why do you ask me why? Anyway, we want to hear from point. you. We want to hear uh -huh. from you what you have to say. And if you go but, to the meetings, they, you know, say but then no. they come back to the same situation that this is what we are going to do exactly. before mm -hmm. even 
So it's it's pretty it frustrating. To, anyway, it's very frustrating. frustrating. And it gets to a point where how much can you survive with, or how much, or how low can an award be before it's not even worth you coming to look at it? You know, and that's that is, is the what point happened. Mm -hmm. We always mm -hmm. talked about our big our our big priority was food and shelter. I talked to Marianne Labarge about it a uh, hundred right. times, and then Carol Reinhardt yeah. had persuaded me last year to fund some of the community uh, the legal aid stuff mm -hmm. in that turn it, but we really did not get away from food and shelter because a lot of the legal aid questions actually apply to being able to stay in their own place for shelter so it gets to the point you wonder ah, I mean it's yeah. such how do you keep all these balls up in the air and well let me tell you something with the community that we serve the situation is completely different and I have to say that, and I believe in that, and I am one of, you know, I believe that because I have one, I think that everybody knows my story. Yeah. You know? <laughs> everybody knows very clear. Without Casa Latina, I would not be where I am. Yeah. We all, we understand that. And, and you know, or everything that I have today, it has been some way because Casa Latina. Because they insisted, yeah. do you want to come to the... I'm saying, you know, I think that you're going to take advantage of that. And if they don't do that, you know, so many people that are getting a lot of support, they have changed. And you know that I, I always get excited because I know, you know, I know what is happening yeah. there. I know. The situation is that even when we are not able to develop programs to continue doing as much as we were doing before, this is the commitment. We are going to complete reapplication fuel assistance, housing, Medicare, name it. That is something that the elders is not, are not getting anywhere, that a lot of people in the community that they are not connected to anyone are not going to get, because mm -hmm. they don't know the language. They don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. And there is no place to go in Hampton County, in Franklin County. The only place that they have is here. And mm -hmm. we receive people from Hampton and Franklin. Yeah. Because they don't have where to go. Mm -hmm. They, you know, people that have moved, they come back. They come from everywhere. They say, you know, I really want to go. I need to reapply again for myself. They don't know even in Spanish. In they Spanish. don't know how to do it. Yeah. So that kind of service, mm -hmm. if they don't get that, that means that they are going to run without medical insurance. Yeah. They are going to have problem with housing. Mm -hmm. They are going to be. They are not going to be able to get your assistant. They are not going to complete the application for week. Mm -hmm. They are not going to complete documentation for doctors, like, you know, uh, you know how much, uh, you know, if you are diabetic, you need to complete these forms. Who is going to complete that for them? Nobody's going to do it. So it's different. They can't go to the survival center to get that. They can't go to Big Brothers, Big Sisters to get that. They can't go anywhere. They just go to Casa Latina because they know that they are going to get that there. That part, you know, for that reason, I always say it's information and referral with case management. That is what Casa Latina has to do with the people that are not going to be able to move to, to do something different mm -hmm. for so many reasons. And that was interesting for my question when I asked about the outreach, because the outreach is important. And they, because you connect them. You know, you have to see when you connect them, you know who lives there, you know who is that. You call them, you ask them to come to the activities, because then we have the encuentro. And even when we have gone through so bad times, we always spend so much, some, you know, some money in those activities, because those are the activities that are going to bring everybody together yeah. to connect with each other. And it's so beautiful that you can see that people develop the relationship and they are going to be, you know, after you see them, because they met yes. there, you see them connected. And, they, and you know, they support each other. Mm -hmm. I have people in the community that have gone to doctor's appointments, to, to so many things to help, you know, to the college, to, to get the services. I help you. I go with you. Mm -hmm. And you have seen that through, you know, Families with Power. Because it's the co other collaboration that we go. And, and that is my commitment. I left, I said to Lillian, you know, I know that it's going to be hard for a while, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here. Because this is what, you know, I believe that the work that is done, you know, has to be continued. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to leave, you know. I believe that we have to continue doing the same thing. It, the, the activity for the three things stay. You are a great so person and advocate for this program. You really are. No. Thank you. I mean, you're wonderful. I'm telling you, every year. We're going to be more serious. No, I, no, I am. You know, I am serious with this, uh, and I do it in a way because I love it. Because I don't. 
I, I am always excited about the work that is, you know, done because I... If, if we get the way that it is. Yes, it is. Okay, they come here, they cannot speak English. Some of their families cannot either speak English. And you're there, so you're giving them the right sources here. Health insurance, mm -hmm. their, mm -hmm. you know, their rental, food. I mean, and you're helping them to be able to socialize them. When I went up to Florence Grammar School, right, everybody was so happy and enjoying themselves. And that's mm -hmm. another thing I'd like you to talk about is the three important events that is extremely valuable to Casa Latino, which is the Three Kings Day, and you go on with the leadership training in the Project Major. You talk about those? Yeah. About the functions of them and how crucial are they okay. for, this, for Casa Latino? The Three Kings Day activity, you know that it's a support that we, that's at the beginning of the year, it's January 6th, but we go after January 6th and, and we invite the whole community and United Way, uh, you know, support us with the uh, toys. We are doing a lot of, uh, uh, we are asking for donation now, and it, almost everything is covered with the donation that the people do from mm -hmm. the community and United Way and the donation that some specific people do for that activity. And, and we are able to do that because a lot of people from the community come and support to do that, to, to develop that activity. Without them, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody enjoys that. Everybody's like, you know, that is so important. Uh, you have there the, the, the leadership program. That was something that happened one period of the time. leadership training. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, and we continue connected with uh, what, what was happening before was that Casa Latina was paying part of my time, a couple of hours during the week. A, to, to be part of a family empowerment. We don't have money anymore for that, but I'm going to continue doing it as a member of the board. So I'm going to continue with that. A, and the programs that we develop depends on you know the grants that we have. Right now we have a, some money from you, a Women's Fund mm -hmm. and Community Foundation. Yeah. And what Lillian is going to be doing is a group a, of women and girls, because it's Women's Fund who is giving us the money, a, to talk about... about a, you know, the budget, how we can, you know, develop the budget, financial things, you know, whatever is under financial uh, in, in our families. And uh, we are working in collaboration with Community Action, mm -hmm. Florence Bank, mm -hmm. uh, is doing that. and family, Families with Power, you know, the, the members, some of the members are coming, but uh, we are uh, in, you know, in connection to, uh, to bring the families that we have and Probably we are going to have a America. We don't know if we are going to have her participating in some of the of the, the the sections with the kids for the kids. for the kids because Lillian runs the the, the women. women, but we are a, now coordinating who is going to be with the kids at the time that the adults mm -hmm. are there. You know, the, the mothers are there, the girls, because women's fund wants us to have just girls. Yeah. So now I just wanted to ask you quickly. Like with United Way and Highland Valley Elder and the Cooley Dixon Hospital, are these a definite secured funding that you'll be getting from Yes, them? this is the beauty of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are gonna be, it's gonna be just one person. I know that this is gonna go, you know, someday the economic situation is gonna change in this state and things are gonna be different. You know that we have the support of, you know, Peter Coco is sending to us all kind yeah. of information that, yeah. uh, you know, every, everybody that knows Casa Latina is connected to sending information. But what we have up to now, we have a, a, the support of United Way. They have been like a, this last a, January, there was a meeting, I couldn't be there for a situation that, you know, but the plan was that I was going to be there, but uh, Lillian, uh, with Heather, uh, that is the president of the board, uh, Jim Ayres from, from yeah, United yeah, Way, yeah. Uh, Mary Claire Higgins was there, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Harness from Kulidi Kingston Hospital Kingston was Kingston there. Hospital. They had a brainstorm, you know, to, to, you know, start talking about, you know, what can be done and how it's going to be done. And Jim Ayres, and we didn't mention that, I know that you had that in your notes, uh, that uh, Jeff Harness, from from Kulidi Kingston Hospital, he has been with us since uh, we started to have the problem with the medical interpreted program, and and he knew how important it was for Casa Latina to keep that program, 
and and he saw you know through the through the years what happened and he said you know i'm going to continue you know talking about it talking about it until we get something from quality kinson hospital <coughs> we got a the year before we got a seven thousand five hundred dollars yeah. this year we got 15. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be there and I'm you know, they know how important is Casa Latina. So they gave us that money to develop the database. Mm -hmm. You know, that up to now we always yeah. write down. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's getting better and better. Uh, but it's coming to the point that we can get, you know, the information through the database. And it's important for them because they get that impor impor information, you know, to work in the hospital with that information. So we are getting the support from the United Way that has been consistent uh, for, for a few years now, yeah. with that amount, and uh, and you know, the 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 uh, how can I say? I think that they have a big commitment with us. They know yeah. that the work that we are doing, they believe that the work that we are doing. Uh, so it's United Way, it's Cooley Dickinson Hospital, Highland Valley Elder Services. They have been giving this for to Casa Latina for more than ten years now. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think that they are going to change. Mm -hmm. You know what they have. Um, it's not a lot of money, but it's yeah. yeah. So it's the, the medical interpreting program, we have the contract, so we get monthly an income, and depending on how many interpretations we, we have every month, mm -hmm. we have another income. Exactly. And it's, all, it's always around, you know, 30, 35,000, mm -hmm. it goes up and down, but, and that is, you know, we, we hope that that is going to continue. We, you know, nothing has been said that is going to change. You're asking the questions that I have. Well, we, we, need we need to wrap up. We do need to wrap up. I quickly wanted to find out the the, the status of the office and that you guys are at uh, the Florence Community Center. It, it, the city is likely to surplus in it, and we don't necessarily know who's going to buy it at this point, mm -hmm. but we're favor the RFP is likely to favor whomever would allow the current tenants to stay in, but I'm pretty sure there will be, regardless of what it is, there will be a rent increase of some sort. And I don't know what kind of pressures that puts on. I would imagine that puts some more pressure on. Right? And, um, and one of the things we were discussing before you came in was the possibility of combining you guys combining your efforts and, and, and resources with people like the next candidates who are up or the Center for New Americans. I know you work with them. In the, in we have had the conversation okay. already. Right. We actually had the we were supposed to call Peg, Peg. To, to find out more about it. But we have thought about that, you know, we don't need a big space. We no. have a storage where we saved a lot of right. things that we have to keep forever. Uh, because we, we, that space is not a big space. Right. That so if it. we have to move to a small space... Is it, is we, it possible? In the Center for New Americans first got their start in Hampshire Heights in, the, in one of the empty yeah, apartments. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there are any empty apartments that might be able to have... So you guys could have a presence at, at Florence or Hampshire Heights and then also possibly at the at the James House for administrative offices because there there's daycare, there's uh, there's access to services, the GED program, mm -hmm. literacy project, and Center for New Americans. Classrooms, so computers. Classrooms. That would be great. We yeah. have talked about that a lot. We so. We'll talk. We'll, oh, okay. good. Well, that good. I'm glad I. Yes. That's that'd be uh, great. And, and the good thing is that also we have a good relationship with housing authority. Oh, that's, uh, that's good. It comes it to the point that is, I, I can say it's good. Yeah. You yeah. know, because for many years we, you know, that how hard it was to have, a, you know. Right. But for the last uh, couple of years, after we had the meetings, yeah. it yeah. has been improving, improving, and it has come to the point that we call housing authority, and they call us back. We resolve the situation yeah. without no oh, problem. Yeah. You know, so and and thanks to the you know Mary Claire yeah. Higgins, you you know you know exactly what happened. So, so you know that that and, and we know we those places in, in Hampshire Heights yeah, right. and Forest Heights. We, we we have been there many times because we have developed a uh, meeting in those places. Right, right. Uh, yeah. On your budget. You, oh, you've had almost 4000 I thought that you were sending us out. I know. We, we need to wrap up. I know. Like, just really quick, $3,900 a telephone and uh, internet. Who is your provider? Is it Comcast? No. No. It's, uh, it's one, one communication. communication. Okay. Is the, yeah, one communication. Yeah, we try. We have done everything we can do. And I, I don't know if you <laughs> know about this. Something well, else that's, that's, less actually, than that. if you got into the James house, you probably wouldn't have to worry about it. I that's know. kind of like, uh, yeah, uh, there you go. That's right. All right. Oh, I won't okay. carry any burdens. That's what I'm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a couple of That's right.
Thank you for coming. Thank, thank, you, thank you. And have my sister. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye, Lillian. Goodbye, Bye, Dana. Bye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Goodbye. Thank you. No, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just a drill. They have to do an alarm test. I wonder if we're going to do a few more. Oh, yeah, we always do. Well, yeah. I'd imagine it's probably, but I wonder if they do a sequence of alarm tests. She's great there. Yeah. Come on. Hey. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Hello. 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 Does she want to come in too? Who does she belong to? You? <laughs> 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 the opportunity to sit in the media. I'll be right back. I'm just going to try to catch her. Oh, okay. <laughs> You'll love this. This is fun. <laughs> no, it's, it's really boring. We'll spice it. Can we start? Please, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know if we had to wait for Peg or not. Um, Lori Millman. Uh, nope, actually, uh, Russell Bradbury Carlin. I'm the executive director. Lori Millman is our development uh, director. So she's the one that put together the. You are? Ooh, and can that's you, Russ Carlin. Yeah. Okay. And can you go down the line and just tell us who you are? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Nudin Babu. I'm coming from Ivory Coast, West Africa. Uh, I'm living in North Africa. Would you spell your name, please? N O U R D I N E. N O U R D I N E. I would have never got that. Nudi. Hi, my name is Sasha Lias, and I came from Florida. Welcome um, to the Community Development Block Grant Committee, and um, I'd like to have introduce you to Bill Dwight, who's our council president and counselor at large, counselor Tacy, who is um, a counselor in Ward 7, and Carol Reinhardt, who is the chair of the Human Rights Commission, and I'm city councilor Miriam Large from Ward 6. Right. And, okay. and Peg Keller. Yes, all too nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I just want to let you know that this meeting is being recorded and videoed by North Street Association. Hi. Who wants to ask questions? Okay. Hi. Thank you, guys. Russ, I don't know. Do you want to give a, a brief uh, overview? Or? Yeah, yeah, if I can, I'd just like a quick uh, overview of things and explain why I brought uh, yeah. some folks along with me. So, um, so the... What we're asking funding for is a particular aspect of the work that we do. I mean, Center for New Americans works with immigrants and refugees in the area. Um, and, uh, you know, for a long time we've run English classes and uh, doing citizenship assistance work. But um, this particular funding is focused around what we call education and career advising. Um, it's something we've done for a long time in our English classes, and our support team has helped people find jobs and so forth. Um, and so we've done that, I think, it's the entire time Center for New Americans has existed. But um, there's a little bit of serendipity here in that our main funder is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, they fund, I think, like about 70% of our operating expenses, and they require that we have match funding, which is why we come to, you know, cities working for, for funding as well as other places. Um, there are have this increased focus on helping programs um, help the folks they work with um, get for further their education and or get into a career. Um, and there's been a real push for this and uh, so it kind of goes along with you know the priorities of, of the town and the city. Um, and right now what we've been doing is kind of amping up our, how we do this process. When we were first doing it, it was, we saw it as kind of a very simple process in some ways where we would, you know, we were always asking our students, and these are, are a couple of our former students, um, like what their goals are. And often their goals are looking for a job or, um, you know, furthering their education, and then we kind of go with that. But now what uh, we're doing is really starting to ask that question even beyond kind of that initial 
what's your goal? But we're starting to say, have you thought about education? Have you thought about career? And it used to be that we'd ask that question and then we would, you know, maybe help people figure out how to do a job listing, maybe do a resume, and then we would often, you know, connect them to the career center and we kind of like hand them off to the career center, mm -hmm. hand them off to community college. But the thing that we're really realizing is that if we really want to have good outcomes, we really want to help folks who are working with, students who are working with, really be successful, it's a lot more complicated than just that. Um, and the, I, I, I could go into great detail, but I won't. But like two of the things I would say that, um, that we've come to realize, one is that um, not a lot of cultures think about goals the way that the U.S. culture thinks about goals. So, you know, we often, a lot of places think about kind of like shorter term goals, but we kind of live in a culture where we can kind of think and dream big, you know, like, oh yeah, sure, I want to be an astronaut, or sure, I want to, you know, do this, and kind of can start to, we know, or we get, are taught in our culture how to make the make steps in that direction. So we realized that just asking that question wasn't enough. We really needed to infuse into the into our classroom this idea of goal setting. Like, really, what does it mean to have, to have a goal? So, um, and what can you, what can a goal look like here in the United States, which might not be the case in your, in your country? So that was one place where we really kind of expanded this conversation deeper into our program. And the other is the whole idea of handing off to another um, uh, program. Like, you know, the Career Center or a community college is really good, but if you aren't used to how to navigate those places, they're not, if you've never, you know, I mean, think about going to another country and maybe someone saying, like, go take the subway, right? And you're like, okay, first I have to know what the subway looks like, what the word says, what the symbol is for it, and then every subway in every single city, even in the U.S. culture, is very different how you get like, your ticket and your token. It's similar going to these places. You don't just walk in and there's someone, hi, I'm the person at the community college that helps everybody. You have to find your way into the building, who to talk to, and then there are particular people to talk to. You talk to one person to about community college. You talk to someone else about financial aid. You talk to you know, so on and so forth. So we really realize that we need to um, partner much more heavily with these different agencies that we're working with and really learn from them what their process is, learn from us what to expect when they have folks who are learning English come into their program. Sometimes they would also be rebuffed when they, when they came in. Um, so really, that's kind of our focus for this year, and that's what this funding is going to help us do, is to really kind of increase our outcomes and help our students. Um, so you doing? <clears throat> you want to work on transitioning out of your program? I think the, it, it, once people transition out of your program, you're helping with the with the transition. It's not just a there you go, good luck, best of luck to you. Thanks. Yeah. The, and, and you guys are based in the James House. Yep. And and there's a number of programs there that I imagine you guys are dovetailed with uh, yep. working with the delivery project. Perfect. And yeah. Among others. And so I and actually what you say makes perfect sense. It really would, I mean, and I think part of the American culture, as you pointed out, is compartmentalization, which is that we don't recognize that this is part of a continuum. It should all be part of a continuum as a part of it, as opposed to moving from, door, you know, room one to room two to room three, and everything's going to be perfectly evident and understandable. And yep. I can't navigate like that. I don't know how to function in a system like that. I mm -hmm. my but my heart starts to palpitate if I'm thrown into something new mm -hmm. and don't have a sense of familiarity or somebody I can call on mm -hmm. to help me with the transition. So how, how does that, how is it going to manifest itself that way? I mean, would, are you guys actually going to, um, do you do follow-up or do you accompany your students as they go to job interviews or go to, mm -hmm. or go to the community college or go to any program? You guys send someone along? Yeah, um, and there's multiple answers to, <laughs> to, to that to that question. So I'll try to I'll try to pinpoint. Um, one is that, and the part of this funding is going to fund a position we call the alumni so alumni program, which is run by Peg. Um, we call her Peg RJ because we have two Pegs, Peg RJ, but Peg Johnson. Um, and we created this program a few years ago because people would leave our program and then. We, you know, we hopefully had handed them off somewhere, and they would kind of drift off. And people would come back because they really were connected to us and ask questions. And we realized it was a real need, so we created this role. And really, what this role has developed into um, over the years has been kind of like a education career advising after people leave. So, for instance, there's a program at 
uh, Holyoke Community College, where Sasha goes, did you ever take part in the College for a Day? Did you do that with Peg? College for a Day? Did you do that? Um, I took a um, with Okay, yeah. okay. Well, there's this um, program that uh, human, Holyoke Community College is called Col College for a Day, where they have, uh, you know, um, folks working on their GED and people learning English come in and kind of go through the school. So we have, that's not part of our, our, we don't do that within our regular English classes, but our alumni person stays in connection with all of our alumni and lets them know about this and then meets them, get, gathers them all and walks them through the uh, process of going through college for a day where they get introduced to the college exactly to kind of walk them through, literally walk them through the different places they go and what the process would be. Um, so, and, and then, to answer your question a little bit further, we're also kind of figuring this out as we go along a little bit. Um, one of the things that I'm pulling together um, is um, sometime in April, I, I think it's going to happen, is I'm calling it an advising summit. So we're getting all the folks who have an advising role, they may not call it that within the agency, but we're getting them from the Literacy Project, from our program, from Greenfield Community College, from the Career Center, and from Holyoke Community College. And these are all the people who actually sit down with students and kind of walk them through the process. Um, we're all going to sit down and basically learn about you I, I came on about a year ago and uh, into this role so and I often think to myself because I'm learning as I'm going along what the system is really like I, I keep thinking about the students and and what they have to learn and I'm you know as I'm learning too and um, you know there's good everybody knows about each other but people don't know each other in a deep enough way to make that handoff. And so that's what the, this is going to be the first part of a process where everybody sits down and goes, so how do you do advising? So I know when I send someone to Greenfield Community College who to ask for, who to go to. Um, and we're going to do that for each other. And then we're going to start to identify what are the hurdles. Um, and then what can we do to overcome those hurdles, either now or in the future, and figure out ways to overcome those. It, it just, if any of this is going to work, really, it, it really should just be should be really easy. There should be, I'm, I'm, when I say map, I'm almost thinking literally a map where it goes, I'm done at Center for New American, then I want to go get my GED. Oh, I go downstairs and I talk to blah, blah, blah. Or I want to go, you know, and it should be fairly, it should be seamless. It should like be so the subway map, there you go. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah. You should, um, yeah. we, the candidates who were in just before you was Casa Latina. Okay. And Casa Latina actually would be quite helpful, I think, on some of, the, I, I think, there are, you guys have some overlap as far as advising. Casa Latina, of course, goes out to the Latino community, mm -hmm. um, and particularly homes and families that are uh, isolated uh, uh, culturally and, and by language as well. Yep. But they also do similar things. They do career advisement, school advisement, mm -hmm. uh, translation services, and things like that. But they do. They've been working on these transition issues that you just that you're describing mm -hmm. too. So. Mm -hmm. it, it, it would rhyme really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'm trying to figure out in the your spreadsheet the, right, the difference between uh, a Greenfield and Amherst and the Northampton allotments. Okay. Greenfield and Amherst appear to be three times the size of Northampton allotment. Yeah. I, 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 I'm just, it's just a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, uh, that, um, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, my... It's based on the history that I know that we've applied to all, um, you know, all three uh, community development block grants. I know that at one point we received more, um, and then there was some thing that happened in the last year. I guess there was, a, 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 I'm not quite exactly clear, but there was an yeah. extra piece of money that we were getting at one point, and when the funds were cut last year, it ended up it was a bigger cut because this extra piece of funding was moved or was not used in the same way it was used before. So I think they were a little bit more on par in the past. Um, but it definitely took a big leap. I think it was like 17 a year before, and then went down to yeah. The genesis like, for my question is um, there was huge support for the CNA and at the James House throughout the whole community. Yep. And um, so I just, when I look at the, the numbers, yeah, it's, it just strikes me as odd. Um, it strikes Russell as odd too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think several times around about this. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I've looked at it 10 times. I must be miss. That's why I asked you. I must be missing something here. Yeah, no, no. It's a, yeah, it's a significant. It's a significant shift. I don't think it's always been that way. I think literally this year was the 
it was the bigger cut. I think historically, even before last year, it was still in the you know. Do they fund the less for five just digits? Yeah. Like Green, like uh, Amherst and Greenfield. And I don't know anything about Greenfield. Okay, I just thought it asked. But Amherst okay. does. Yeah. Yeah. Always been curious. Yeah. yeah, I mean each. I mean each uh, city has a different, slightly different focus. But really, I think they're all kind of basically the doing the same type of I mean, it's funding. A, yeah, it's a fabulous program. Yeah, okay. well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We only um, have a few moments left, so it would be great to hear from yes, the folks. Yes, thank you. I was just going to ask yeah. if we could do that. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to speak? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would they? You bet they would. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I asked both of them to talk just a little bit about how <coughs> our services help them either. Yeah. Think about or move towards a career or, yeah. or education. So, uh, as the recent uh, of American, I learned English because um, I have been here a year ago. So, I learned English. I did a class, um, level class. I start for with a five level, mm -hmm. four, five. four or five. And then we did the next steps class together, and the center of New America helped me to do my CNA program with a certificate of nursing assistant. Right. And I also did a writing class, mm -hmm. a class from Greenfield Community mm -hmm. College. Very nice. So what language did you speak before? French. French. <laughs> so, what are your goals when you think about this and, and the conversation about goals? What would what would you like to? Yeah, the first time when they asked me what what was my goal, I said I don't know. Uh -huh. Just it to improve my English first. Yeah. yeah. So, and after I. Thought about the CNA program, and I was interested, so I did it. You did it. So now you you have your CNA certification. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I have CNA certification, certification of the the program, and I'm gonna do the certificate with the red 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 cross red cross, red cross. Red cross. and be ready. That's good. Right. Thank you. And, and Russ spoke about goals here in the U.S. and, and goals yeah. in, in your country. Yeah. How are they different? It's really different because in my country, you can say really you have a goal. You have to be with your parents uh, willing and what you have to think about what's going to be helpful, helpful for you. Not really what you want to do, but what's going to be helpful for the, the family, because you have to take care of the family, your father, your mother, your children, everybody. Do you come from a big family? Excuse me? Do you come from a big family? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm just yeah, checking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already different. Thank you. Good job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, been here um, since 2011. I um, start um, in ESF in CNA, um, level 3, 4, two, 2, 3. And then I took 3, 4, and then I met with her. And my goal was to um, finish um, my degree. So they prepare they prepare me to 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 continue my ESL classes in HCC. So next semester I'm going to finish my level five and I can I I can take <coughs> um, some class for my bachelor in business. In business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get an associate's degree. That's I have um, in my country I. I have 24 credit uh -huh. business. I want to finish here. Say again what country you're Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico? Yeah. Ah. 
Which is okay, I'm going to. Which, you, you're, you're, <laughs> I'm having you come from the Mideast or something. No. <laughs> so, so do you, do you reside here in Northampton? And what is it? Do you take the bus to Greenfield, or do you do these courses online? Or um, she was the HCC. The I'm the HCC. HCC. Yeah, no. the Hoyle. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, last semester. And, and transportation is. And first, I um, I take like a one week um, bus, but my goal is to get a car, so mm -hmm. I save money mm -hmm. and I get a car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you will. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Thank you. Do you. And do you do classes on HCC campus or down at the uh, at the, the the what is it, the building that they have downtown Oyoke on Main Street, which is. It's the Pink, the pink Right, yeah, because up on the second floor, isn't that they doing uh, ESL and, and um, adult learning there too? No? But you're at, you go to HCC yeah. campus, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's actually a, uh, it's like a transitions program that they have there. Um, so that, that's, yeah. it's a, which has an English, I think my understanding is correct, has an English component to it, but it's right. like a transition before people get onto the campus. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you passed that. You're yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're finished. You're going to complete your uh, bachelor's degree. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I, my, I, I chaired uh, transportation department. Now I'm the vice chair. Uh -huh. And I, yeah, so I'm right. interested in uh, <laughs> transportation and how you help people get around and um, if they have anything to say about that. I know it doesn't mean funding. And I'm always interested in the transportation part, getting from here to there. I don't know if you find difficulty in. For me, before the the transportation, very difficult. I I live in River Run, and they don't have to. Um, no, 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 no sidewalk, sidewalk or nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question about the funding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking for this amount to cover, is it the position that's called um, alumni coordinator? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the main parts. That's uh, the alumni is the person I was talking about earlier who works with the student so center the, after they leave. So the focus of your request for the, these funds are aimed toward the work of the alumni coordinator and and also um, the work that we're doing in our English classes. So the whole idea, what, what we have, there's, I kind of see that there are kind of three things that we do when it comes to education and career. There's the conversations we have in our English classes. Mm -hmm. um, then there we have an ed education career advisor, in which I heard Maureen is her name in, in Northampton. So she meets regularly with the students and they create a plan together. Um, and then we also offer specific classes, um, either a college readiness class, mm -hmm. um, these are separate from the English class, or we have what's called contextualized, there's a whole new word, uh, uh, contextualized classes. So, for instance, uh, Nordine was interested in, in healthcare, and we had a, we call it Bridges to Healthcare, so it kind of helped um, teach some of the language, those particular English words around that prepare her mm -hmm. to be able to take a certified nurse assistant class mm -hmm. at GCC. Mm -hmm. Then we have several that look at particular um, work sectors that have a lot of openings, manufacturing, green jobs, and um, mm -hmm. healthcare are the three that we have. So um, the other funding that we're asking for this is for our ESL coordinator who's helping to train the teachers to have these conversations in the class more, and then our computer um, teacher, because we're bringing a lot more, in particular like the college readiness class, we have to bring technology into that class. If students are going to be thinking about college, they're going to have to become more comfortable with using computers, and so there's a lot of other people in this mix, but those are the ones we're focusing on. You're sort of parsing thing. out the 12,000 that you're asking for, you're parceling out pieces to each of these positions. Yeah, right? yeah, it's like a little bit to this yeah. thing, with her, a little bit to this person, and then there's other people, like Maureen isn't in this funding, even though she's doing advising, but yeah. we just decided to um, move this to these other folks. Yeah. And I have another question oh, back to that, and that is, we often find ourselves saying, and if we don't get this money, what will you do? Cry, though. Cry. No, um, we'll, uh, no, if we don't, um, we will, um, and you know, we're 
pretty resourceful. We look for funding elsewhere. It's part of the reason why we kind of spread the funds. I mean, one thing I do know is that, you know, at least for the time being, it seems like CDBG money is slowly yep. being whittled down. So I didn't really want to put it all in one oh, particular role. And then, if, heaven forbid, it would all go away one moment, we'd have to scramble to fill that or lose that person. So, um, so we would look to leverage other types of funding, okay. um, that, you know, or cut back. Yeah, it would be one or the other, or a bit of both. So it was it was to that point, building on that, to just let you know that um, this year we have one hundred sixty-one thousand dollars in requests, and we have less than half of that to offer. Yep. Eighty thousand. With and in fact, actually, that's the optimistic proposal because we don't know if sequestration is going to factor in and actually yeah, have an impact on that, that as yeah. well. Yeah. So uh, and consequently, so the awards are always. We're invited to participate in this excruciating process of trying to find, uh, of trying to fund the most worthy projects that we have available in the community with this paltry and ever dwindling amount of money. Right and so, so that's just to, to let you know, and that, and that, and in fact, actually, the awards are in no way a reflection of our mm -hmm. our esteem for the programs that come before us. I mean, and, yep. and particularly CNA, we've been we've been devoted to CNA from the first time they got. Uh, Broken down computer in Florence in Hampshire Heights yeah. in a room there, and the end, and we continue all the way through Jim's yep. uh, yeah. legacy, and then now yours. So we we just want to let you know that yeah, that's that's <laughs> the landscape, the ugly landscape that we're walking through. So, so what will happen if we cannot give you the funding that you're asking for? Can you explain what will happen? if you don't get the amount of money that you're asking for? Yeah, um, I guess, well, it's a little hard to know at this point because our fiscal year starts in September. Um, and we already know we're getting cuts. Um, and, you know, in this, even though this is very segmented for Northampton, we, we also know we're um, getting probably pretty substantial, if not an all-out cut in Greenfield um, and also in Amherst, too. So these will kind of compound on each other and they're all very similarly focused. Um, I guess we would look to refund and that, I don't know where that would come from right at the moment. Um, and if not, then we would basically have to scale back, you know, cut, cut people's hours um, and, uh, you know, retreat on this. I, I don't know how much we'd be able to do. Um, our advisors do um, a mixture of things uh, and as a lot of agencies do, a lot of people do like four or five different particular roles. Mm -hmm. And so our advisors are, they're kind of charged with um, advising around career and education, but also doing generalized support. And I guess, to be honest, if I were to kind of like balance things out, you know, it was like helping someone figure out how to get housing, or, you know, um, you know, then that, you know, who would end up pulling back on, have to pull back on the education and career part. I mean, I don't, we, we wouldn't lose that, I don't think. I don't think there's any way we could. Um, but, you know, if we had to shave people's hours, cut people's hours, or, or you know, I hope not cut someone's role, um, you know, we'd, we'd end up start making those type of weights, kind of like what, you know. As, as, as bleak as Bill um, made it, we still have $125,000 less for for applications than we had last year. Yeah. Oh, it was a $1,000 loss. So um, yeah. either the agencies have failed or just gave up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So yeah I'm sure there's a diminishing yeah. returns yeah. kind of point. Yeah. But it's still very bleak. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Does she have anything to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to speak? She's busy on her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you yeah, very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Oh, I'm sorry. You know. It's okay. <laughs> thank you all for coming in. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right, right, right. Twenty-five thousand. Right. That was. Uh, they don't give anything to cuts on Latina. Yep. Oh, yeah. Twenty-five thousand. Oh, I, I, I think basically it's just four. Hey. Hi. Hi there. Don't What's up, for tonight? It's just, just you. Just me. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, it's all okay. I'm sorry. You know, it's the, only you. You know,
Thank you. You know this so well, so that you Rose used to sit with you present very well. Oh, so. Boy, thank you. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. Um, I just want to let you know that <coughs> this meeting is being recorded and videoed by the North Street Association. And to my right, I have Carolyn, Carol Reinhardt, who is the chair of the Human Rights Commission. I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge. And we have Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7. Oh, again. <laughs> yeah, and Councilor at Large and our Council President, Bill Joy. Thank you, Renette, for being here. Sure. And maybe you could give us an overview of the Center for Human Development, please. I, Big Brother. Big Brother's Big Sisters. Right. Yeah, I can do better with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County, which is a program of the Center for Human Development, um, my role is that I, I direct Big Brothers Big Sisters and have been for 28 years. Um, and we match children who are um, facing a lot of risk factors with mentors from the community who um, make a commitment to spend three to five hours a week with a child for at least a year developing um, a close and dependable friendship um, and providing them with experiences they would never have otherwise. Um, as I said, we ask for a one-year commitment. It's rare that the matches last for one year. Most of them last a lot longer than that. Um, our average match length is two and a half to three years, but we know, especially I know after being here this long, that many of them go on lifelong and really deeply transform the kids' lives. As a matter of fact, we just had our bullathon last week, and one of our big brothers, uh, who was matched about two and a half years ago, moved to Washington, D.C., and he's still been in touch with his little brother, who's a, a child from Northampton, and came up from Washington, D.C. for the weekend just to take his little brother to the bullathon. So, I mean, these these connections are deep, and they really go on, and they're incredible. And I just think, you know, how affirming is that to this kid who's had entirely too many disappointments for the short time he's been on the planet, to have this guy who really cares so much about him. So it's a connection. Yeah. yeah. So are you, you still to... dealing um, with Smith College or affiliated yes. with them, right? Yes. Because to me, that is, I think I really like that program. Yes. Especially when you're having the students who who are there coming in as a freshman and possibly spending four years until they graduate. And then within that period of time that they look at new freshmen coming in and they have somebody lined up as a mentor for that same student. Exactly. And the kids who are in those site-based programs, well, they're a little bit double-edged, the site-based programs. They're fabulous. And the kids who we focus on for those programs are kids you know, who come from families, as, as most our kids do, with low educational attainment, a lot of, you know, I, I think the thing, growing up in Northampton or Amherst, you know, these kids grow up in the shadows of higher education, and they go to school with kids who, you know, are from that, that kind of world as well, and they grow up in families, you know, that have nothing to do with it, who, when nobody's ever graduated from high school. So that's very powerful, like that Smith program for Northampton. We have the same, same thing in Amherst with UMass and Amherst College. And, you know, this kid can is suddenly on the campus. They're getting together with their big sisters weekly, and they're spending time on the campus, and it just really increases their comfort zone. You know, this feels, this feels like, oh, I could be here. You know, my big sister is sort of goofy, so she can go to college. I bet I could. And they're having dinner at the dining halls, you know, and this is what the college is giving to them. The college is providing transportation, mm -hmm. giving them full use of the facilities. And at these dining halls, they're getting to have all the ice cream they want. And, you know, I'm going to go to college because you can have all the ice cream mm -hmm. you want. And that's probably as good a reason as any, you know. Mm -hmm. And But it just opens up a whole new world that would never even be, you know, a possibility of thought in their realm of possibilities. So that's very powerful. I think... For some kids, the downside of those site-based programs is that the volunteer is gone for the summer. Yeah. So I, our case managers really take that into account. So they'll go and they'll home visit a child and really get to know a child, speak to the guidance counselor, speak to other agencies working, working with that family. 
and really decide whether this is a child who would best be served by that site-based program or better be served in a match with a community person who's here year-round. Right. And, you know, they make that decision very carefully. And for some kids, you know, they don't want an older person. They, they would do better with a student because a student's going to be cooler and all that stuff. So it's really a very intentional, very conscious decision to see which of those two models will work best for the kid. So it would be a site model and a community model. That's right. right. That's right. The, the Smith College program is site-based because, right. you know, once a week after school, um, they, they pick the kids up at Jack. It's a partner partnership with Jackson Street. Mm -hmm. at, they pick them up at Jackson Street and bring them to the campus where they go with their big sisters one-to-one. -one. They don't stay in a group, so we still really honor that model, which is so the core of our program, that one-to-one -one relationship. And then they do meet back as a group to have dinner together. So, um, yeah. So your, so your record dependability of your kids and their, and their big brothers or big sisters is pretty damn good, isn't it? It is. It is. And, you know... And Which I, says a lot for your screening process, too. I was, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Yeah. I think we're good at the screening, you know. We're tough, and it's just not anybody who walks in the door is going to be a great mentor. You right. know, just because they think they want to do it doesn't mean we think that they're the right person for this kind of volunteer experience. You know, um, I've been here a long time, but our... One of our case managers, who's our case management supervisor, Ruth, has been there for over 21 years, and so she oversees all this. And um, you know, we 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 have a lot of expertise at the program. Plus, we benefit tremendously from being part of a national organization like Big Brothers Big Sisters uh -huh. of America, which is really cutting edge best practices around screening and training the volunteers, and um, that's really key because. What we're about is making sure that, again, I go back to that thing, that these kids don't just get one more disappointment, you know, in their lives. These matches have to be great. We do everything we can to ensure that it's going to be a wonderful experience. And then we don't just make the match and then say, okay, go play. Once we make the match, the case manager stays very, very closely tied to this match. So every month they call the parent to see what the par how the parent's feeling about it. They speak to the child, speak to whoever referred the kid, plus the volunteer meets in person, one-to-one, -one with their case manager to really talk about what's going on, and the case managers, you know, give them ideas of things they could be doing, and really try to troubleshoot if they're so, sort of hearing things in the description that, oh, are they really not connecting so well? How can I tweak this? How can I make sure this is going to work? Plus, the national office, Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, designed this tool that we use, which is called the strength of relationship measure. And so three months into the match, we sort of do this little um, interview with the child, separate from the interview, and do the si a similar interview with the volunteer. And there are certain things that we look for, red flags that may pop up showing that they're not really bonding that well. And then um, we have all sorts of tricks up our sleeves, you know, to, yeah. you know, suggest things to, to really make that relationship bond. One of the biggest misconceptions out there that I, I hear in the public is that Big Brothers and Big Sisters, they are strictly for kids that are orphans. And I try to explain to them, I said, you know, it's not, that's not the truth. And they, 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 they just don't get it. And um, I get it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I get it. Yes, of um, course. Yeah. Of course, right. And, and, um, but it's really, and I see there's ads all over there. There's on the TV, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America and stuff. And they, just, sometimes I, think, I just have to walk away. I, say, yeah. I can't even explain it to you. So. I, I think sometimes, you know, some of these ads try to pathologize the kids, you know, and make them seem so pathetic. And they're not at all. And, um, you know, the kids we serve are, I think, about 80, maybe 90 percent low income. Um, most of them come from families where there's a single parent. Some of them actually have two parents. Yeah. Um, the families are struggling with, you know, issues of poverty. Um, maybe there's been histories of homelessness. Um, the child I was talking about before, where the big brother came back to visit him, there was an incarcerated parent in that family. Um, and, you know, the thing about our program, you know, we're a human service that really comes in there and kind of unites with the parent. And usually, as I said, a single parent, so mostly mom, but not always, and sort of 
with mom, we give the child the gift of this big brother or big sister. And it's something, we're not in there to make a judgment. We're not threatening to take anybody's children away. We're really there to um, do something that's going to, you know, really add a real Absolutely. positive to this family. And I think also, by getting involved with our program, it's an opportunity for the family to connect with an, uh, an organization that's really going to be supportive of them. And maybe the, the trust that builds between the case manager and the mom or dad is really very powerful. And often they'll come to us and we will refer them to other services because we're very involved in COSA and all these different you know, networks of human services. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, we're, we're looking to really enhance the, the lives of the, of the family. So for instance, a child who's matched with a Smith College student, we will very actively try to find a free campership for that kid. And again, using all of our network. So uh, several kids from Northampton ended up going to DASAC last summer, the Deerfield Academy Summer Arts Camp. Mm -hmm. So our wonderful case managers, bless their souls, because they're not supervising that many cases, they will come in the morning and pick the kid up and drive the kid to Zasac or wow. you know whatever camp. We recently worked with the YMCA here and got several camperships for a lot of you know for Northampton kids. So, you know, it's more than just this match. I mean, we're really there to be totally involved, and also because we know that this match is going to work better if mom or dad is invested in it. I mean, if we don't build trust between that parent, then that volunteer is going to go pick up the kid and nobody's going to be home. You know, so it's really important for us to build that relationship of trust. And also, I think that a lot of the families we work with feel very marginalized and feel like um, nobody's ever asking them their opinion about things. So before we even make the match, we encourage the mother or father, whoever the single parent is, to meet the volunteer first. You know, we'll bring that mentor to you know to your house for you to meet them or come to the office, and to make sure you approve of this person for your child. Really take the parents' um, suggestions and the kind of person they would like their child matched with. You know, take that seriously and really honor and respect that parent. You know, they don't often feel that in the world. Do you have husbands and wives that are big brothers and big sisters? Is that we don't do those couples matches. No, we're really about the one-to-one -one thing. Yeah. I mean, we, we tell a big brother or a big sister after they've really bonded with the child that it's okay to occasionally bring their partner along, and then that could be good role modeling. The other thing about our screening process is we do like a two-hour in-depth interview of the volunteer you know, in our office first. And then the second part of our interview is we do a home visit of the volunteer's home. Oh, that's good. And even if it's a student, we'll do it in the dorm room. And if we match a community person who has a significant other, we want to meet that person and interview them and, you know, get a sense of who that is also. I forgot to ask you that question last year. When you left, I went, oh, geez, I wanted to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay, so right now you have 164 children that are on the waiting list. Right. That's when, what it says When here. we wrote that proposal, we probably had a few more. And 57 no. of them who, who reside in Northampton, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have to. And that's mm -hmm. why that this funding is very crucial because of what we're seeing here for figures at 164 and then 57 of who went from Northampton. That's right. And the thing about us right now is that our capacity is rather small. We have three and a half case managers. And um, <clears throat> given that capacity, we know that there are kids on our waiting list that are going to age out before we ever get a chance to serve them. And given everything that I said to you about the kind of case management we do, each case manager has 50 cases at pretty much you know, at, at the most. So, um, you know, you can see what our capacity is. So it's our goal, our long-term goal, which is why we're always doing fundraisers and everything, to really be able to increase our capacity and be able to, 
it's our belief that if we have between five and six case managers, we will be able to serve this county much better, and kids will not grow old on our waiting list. But as long as we're under five, you know, every year Ruth goes through that waiting list and crosses kids off who have aged out. You know, by the time a kid is 15 or 16, they're not going to want to accept a big brother into their life. So you, do, I'm assuming that, given the fact that we've asked this every year and the same thing is every year, that the, the resources are dwindling. Are you, re, are you guys under a lot of stress, um, you know, disproportionately to, to the stress that everyone's actually feeling? And 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 I'll and I'll explain why I say that, Renee, because when I and I think the same thing we said last year. Is that each year, but this year we have one hundred sixty-one thousand dollars worth of requests. We have less than half of that as an award. And in fact, actually, um, we're assuming a ten percent cut from. We had eighty-eight thousand dollars to award last time. This year we have seventy-nine. Yeah. And wow. that's and we're not sure. We're, I was talking about this with Peg. We're not even sure if that takes into account sequestration cuts. Wow. So, so, so consequently, and, and one of our biggest concerns is, you know, the amplitude of our, our awards because it, it, I think Councilor has referred to this. Is there a point of where the award is just it's it's more it's more difficult to even administer than it is to actually achieve the award. I know that you guys use this to, for leveraging purposes. And That's exactly like that, what so. I was going to say. Okay. It. You know, $3,440, I think that's what we get, right. you know, so we know that, you know, it's not a huge amount, but when I write a grant and I say we're getting, you know, CDBG funds from Northampton and CDBG funds from Amherst, and that gives us more credibility. So that gives us more credibility when we write for a grant to Mass Mentoring Partnership that is getting state funds that our legislators right. put into the state budget. So the more I can cite, you know, United Way, CDBG, the more I can cite that kind of support, mm -hmm. the more it gives us sort of that good housekeeping stamp right. of approval. So, you know, I mean, I know the reality. You know, I've seen it dwindle right. over the years. I know what we're all up against. It's, it's amazing, you know, how little you're, you have to distribute. And Amherst just, you know, may right. not get anything this year. Well, the, and the thing is that I and maybe you can actually say this in your narrative to, to for, for other appeals that the proportion that we grant to uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters actually is a reflection of our admiration for the program. But the fact that we that even though the dollar amount is not necessarily a brilliant representation of how much, but it is a significant expression of commitment for the for the program that when we make these awards that that we are. As you say, we're trying to give our seal of approval, our imprimatur. We want anyone who's reviewing that to understand that this is this is actually a loud proclamation. It's not just this little whimper of a token amount that we're. Bringing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, and I, I I do really try to frame it like that. And even you know when you go to grants with community foundation or to beverage foundation, right. I mean it really means a lot. You know, I right. mean you you can say that the city of Northampton gives us some funding. Um, yeah. A little bit of perspective too, with this ten percent cut. This is a total of a forty percent cut in the last three years. Yeah, yeah. So it I, I know. Blows me I, away. I, yeah. I, no, I I've been around. I've seen yes. it just drop and drop and. So I'm curious about what how uh, the national organization uh, supports you. Do you get a certain portion from the national organization? Do you? Is, does it help to leverage from them uh, that we, we see from Good question. We pay dues to them. We pay so dues we pay, to them. and actually, you won't see that in our budget, and this is oh. one of the positive things about CHD. Officially, it's the CHD, it's CHD is the 501c3 that has the affiliation agreement with Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, so that we pay about $6,500 a year in dues oh. to the national office. And so, but it doesn't come off of our budget, it comes off the CHD corporate budget, which is great. Um, but I think that, you know, what Big Brothers Big Sisters of America does is, you know, again, it's another good housekeeping stamp of approval because, you know, they've gotten the Department of Justice to say that their mentoring model 
is evidence-based, it is research-based, and we get access to all of those forms, all of those evaluation tools, those outcome tools, and really, you know, to go to a conference and be amongst your peers and really hear about best practices makes us stronger. Um, the National Office is trying to um, is trying to get funds from the Department of Justice to, you know, they're, they're pretty close. And they did get one round of, of funding, which they did some pass-through grants to agencies. Unfortunately, we did not get it. They didn't give it to small agencies, and we're relatively small. But I think if they keep getting it, we, it will eventually come down to us. We got a great review from them. And again, especially with the National Office, every month I have to fill out, you know, if we're getting any municipal funds, if we're getting any federal funds and all that. And one of their, I did get to talk to them, and one of the things they said to me was, uh, we're really impressed with how diversified your funding is. Mm -hmm. So, and that was because I was able to say that we're getting from the city of Northampton, from town of Amherst, and all that. So it did help, um, and they're trying. And, um, but I also think because, but it really does help us tremendously having the mentoring model that the national office has gotten to be research-based, evidence-based, you know, they have the money to hire the researchers to give us the tools. We could never do that on our own. Now the other day I saw a big truck that said Big Sister, you know, Big Brother, Big Sister, whatever, uh, and donate household goods and it's kids clothes. And Greenfield is what the address was on it, I think. What is Springfield. That? Springfield. It's the spring. It's Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hamden County, and they have this sort of um, this other arm, this entrepreneurial arm, satellite. Where, this satellite, right? Where they set up this company, Heart Springs, and they go all over Western Mass and Northern Connecticut and collect stuff. And they, that that's how, that's their major fundraiser. We do get. 25 cents, I have to, in full disclosure, <laughs> we get 25 cents per pickup. It does not, it amounts to, it doesn't amount to very much. So it's, it's a real difficult thing for us because often when, you know, I'll be asking people to become donors to the program, people will say to me things like, I already give to you, I gave you so many clothes, I put out so much furniture for you, and then, so, I really like people to know that that doesn't go to us yeah. because people can help us in other ways, but it's true, 25 cents per, uh, per, per pickup does come to us. But we want to support our Hampton County colleagues. But it does, and we also get these phone calls from people yelling at us, telling us, we put my, I put my clothes out, nobody came to pick them up, and oh, yeah. so I have to deal with that. So it's a... Yeah. And that heart springs, they have quite a website. You know, so I wonder, pretty and expensive. And they sell all the stuff, I guess, to Savers stores, which are yeah, yeah. thrift shops. Mm -hmm. yeah. And but th but they do pick up all over. What's the <coughs> well, I have another question. Just um, am I correct that you that it's the children at the Jackson Street School that you place exclusively, no, primarily, it's, it's not a um, center. Wrong it's a prop off center, basically. Yeah, well, only for the Smith program. <coughs> for the Smith, that's where they're coming in. But so of the, how many kids are we serving right now? I think 26 in my last quarterly report <coughs> from Northampton at this moment. And of those 26 or 27, only six are in that site-based program. See. So that's how, so our community-based matches are the ones that um, serve kids from all the schools. All the schools. And that's all the schools in Northampton. Yes, yes. We have, yeah, yeah. We even have a big brother. We have this one family in Northampton with four little boys being brought up by their dad. And one of the big brothers there is a principal in one of the schools in East Hampton. And it's one of the most wonderful matches. Very, very sweet. The child is really young. And we have all four of those little boys matched. And it's a wonderful one. And they're not Jackson Street. Is there any other questions? Just wondering if your case managers are doing referrals for families, whether they place the children or not. 
And the, the child's on a waiting list. Do you start a relationship with families? The thing, the thing is, one thing that if the kid goes on our waiting list, we don't really start the relationship. And we often tell, when some, like if a school makes a referral or even if a parent makes a referral, we tell them not to tell the kid that they're uh -huh. waiting for a big brother because if it takes two years, yes, right. it's, that's an eternity for a child. So we only go over there when we know that that kid's on the verge of being matched. If that match becomes active, we, when we open it up and then we get more information and really begin to build the relationship. That's a good question. Thank you. Great organization. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I love it. I feel very fortunate to work there. Well, you've done wonders. wonders. Oh, you've thank you. <laughs> For me, everything's about kids. What? For me, everything's about kids. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's hope, you know. Thank you. For thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 Bye bye. Thank you. See ya. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah. coming in? No, no, she didn't see out there. She's got her iPod. She's got her iPod. She's got her do you want to open the blinds so you can see her? Mm -hmm. oh, you know what I will do? I'll sit right here. Okay. Yeah. Well, just open the blinds. She can do the blinds that are over there. She can come in. Yeah, because why would she want to pass up an opportunity to sit in the room with the door? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you could be playing on your iPod or you can listen to people. Maybe you could introduce yourself to us. Steven Mendoza, I have just started as an SRO program coordinator. I'm Jane Banks, and I oversee the Single Room Occupancy Project and have off and on for uh, throughout the last 14 years. And I just want to announce that this meeting is, and the interviewing is being recorded and videoed by the York Street Association which is Ruth McGrath, who is doing the videoing. And to my right is Carol Reinhardt, who's the chair of the Human Rights Commission. I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6, and Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7, and our Council President and Council at Large, Bill Joy and Pat Keller. Okay. Uh, by the way, Peg just chatted you up pretty big. She's a, she's a big fan of yours already, so you, I bring her donuts. And well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. we knew there was something. <laughs> Peg, Peg is a soft uh -oh. <laughs> But um, um, actually, yeah, the, the context in which she came up discussing Steve's uh, participation is that the, um, in the context of doing outreach in the SROs, of course, comes with its own subset of challenges. And um, and uh, she seems to think that you might be able to pull this off, so just to let you know. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to make a note. Yeah, <laughs> the bar has been raised pretty high. So, so how so how are things for you guys? <laughs> How's things? The money just pouring in and it's in rolling buckets. In. And, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's good. Um, I think that historically we've been able to pull off finding some additional funding so that we can have a full time person. Um, as the SRO coordinator and going into the rooming houses and trying to expand our capacity with coffee hours as, as much as possible. And uh, I know that Nancy Gonzalez Silva has been the coordinator for the last year and a half or so. And so she's done a significant amount of work um, with the tenants in the rooming houses, a lot of the low income folks in the, na in the area and uh, property owners and managers. And so things, are, things have been going well for us. No major issues or complaints. We have some really nice relationships with property managers, which I think is really helpful in helping to um, keep the chaos down that can periodically um, erupt. So, and that, you know, about the census, uh, is it expanded? 
contracted or it stayed about the same. We haven't had. I mean, we've lost a couple of SRO buildings over the last couple of years, and so that's been a bit of a change. But overall, we're still seeing about 100, 125 folks on a regular basis. So um, that's quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Just rattle off a couple of the SROs for a there, well, there's there's the um, Pleasant Street, there's Earl Street. Yep. We have the um, Go West in Florence that we that we go to. The Maples we are in and out of there. Eighty two Bridge. Yes. Yep. Um, Northampton Lodge. Yes, Northampton Lodge. Actually, the uh, the care. congressman just moved into uh, Congressman Jim McGovern just opened his office at ninety four Pleasant Street on the on the, on the retail level. <laughs> you didn't know that? No. That's, uh, yes, I would definitely. She's right then, yeah. I would, yeah. Jim McGovern has set up a permanent um, regional office huh. in 94 Pleasant Street. Huh. Which we think is fantastic. I think it's a great idea. I do, too. I'm surprised. So, how is your relationship with private landlords as opposed to? Um, Things like the Valley CDC and things such as that. Yeah. I know that the 82 Bridge is an LLC, and I don't know if it's owned by Valley CDC. It's owned, is it owned by Valley CDC? So they just set up an LLC. It used to be a private owner, didn't it? A long time ago. They've had it for a while, like a long time. Mm -hmm. And they've even refinanced a couple of times. But I think the only private left is probably Northampton Lodging. Right, yeah. May I really? Yeah. Because yeah. uh, yeah. hmm. 96 is Hat. Yeah. Yeah. Earl Street's Hat. Yeah. Everything else is Valley. And yeah. predecessors used to do some other privates. Um, there was one over near Palmyra Terrace, um, the Graph. There was the one on Maple with the, all the stone. Yep. They're gone. Um, so a lot of the, there's not too many privates left anymore. Hmm. And there's what 60 units in that North Hampton lodging. 58. 58. And you guys have a waiting list. Well, we don't we don't house people there. I mean, the, the managers take the applications and screen and decide who's going to go in there. What the SRO does is we go in and provide support services for the individuals in the rooming okay. houses. We do the coffee hours for, um, for to break the isolation, to provide some social opportunities for folks, to be able to provide, you know, so Steve will be going in and doing a coffee hour and have referrals and resources available for folks to be able to use and access, set up transportation if folks need to go to a doctor's appointment or, you know, apply for mass health. You know, Nancy Gonzalez works with a guy who likes to um, go down to Holyoke and use some of the groceries, go to some of the grocery stores down yep. there for the, you know, so. There's various ways that we provide support for folks. So, like, once he goes into an SRO to a resident, right, do you also look at, say, that resident is on medication, okay, has to have his medication or her seven times a week forever, forever. Mm -hmm. Do you monitor that? I think that if there's a, no. The answer, ultimately, no, well, we don't do, do the that, individual. Though? Well, their, their physician would do that. But what would happen is if we, if the owner or the manager, folks are noticing that this guy's not taking his meds, things are going on, we're going to connect with the individual, with the property manager, and try to coordinate to get that guy, whoever, to see so the doctor and, and take call. them to make sure. But we don't do, okay. we're, not, we're not medically trained in that way. Okay. But the, we will the, make sure that yeah. they get the support the, they need. The, the human contact with, or the, the, the contact, think of them as wellness checks in some level, right? Right. The, the, I was the, just the, the, what what, what Steve's like. doing is wellness checks and also trying yeah. to foster community and, and the idea is to reduce the risk of homelessness or reduce the risk of someone losing yeah. the ability and access to services. And, that, and, and so there Maybe you are cleared to to do med administration, but I'd be pretty surprised. But but that you're not in charge of taking care of someone's meds or taking care of placing someone necessarily. But you're their their charge is to help the people who are in SROs to be able to stay within SROs and not end up on the street. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right. And so we're so you just go in and have a coffee hour with them and talk with them and socialize with them. And do any refer and make sure that they get access to any referrals and information that they might need and any transportation okay. support that they need and um, any sort of rent if they need assistance with rent, making sure that they know where to go to get their rental assistance and all the housing supports. And we provide supports to the managers like HAP, for example. You know, if, if HAP calls Steve and says, geez, you know, Charlie over here is really, he's, you know, he's having a hard time. I think we, he's not taking his meds. We're needing some support. Then we go in okay. and help Charlie make the decision to, you know, seek out some medical support okay. and get himself back That's in, all I you know, that kind of stuff. So, okay. so, so yes, in fact, we do go and have coffee and donuts mm -hmm. and hang out. And there's right. that social aspect to try to get folks out of their units, out of the isolation, connect with each other, and get the supports that they need to be able to be successful. And really, the SRO is a safety net for folks to be able to I was just gonna say, yeah. come to us if they need something and need some support. And so, you know, there's been times when we've been to housing court with folks to help them maintain their, their, their housing so that they don't lose it, whether it's a behavior issue, uh, in a rooming house, or if it's a rental issue, non-payment, just to help them stay and come up with a plan so that they're successful and not terminate it. Thank you, Jim. It, and the reason for some of these questions, with, with limited funding and yeah. dwindling funding, we need to make sure that we're not funding anything with it's a duplicate or a, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, an overlapping uh, service because things are tight. Yes. And so yes. you would be the guy with the people skills that would. Uh, you're the front man. Yeah. You're the guy, huh? It's been uh, it's been really interesting, and you know, I've received a really warm welcome from a lot of people in the SROs and from also the property management people, things like that. So I've been very encouraged by the people that I've interacted with and the people I do. They they're spreading the word for me to get more people down, and we can and we can talk and have more one-on-one -on -one time, whether it be or in a group setting, whatever it may be. So. It's really kind of a, so as we're having this conversation and listening to Bill and Steve, it's really sort of a soft touch program. You know, I oversee a significant shelter program for families in the state, and so it's very compliance based, but individuals in any community are um, sorely under supported in a lot of ways. Folks don't want to uh, support for, you know, individuals' mental health issues and addictions, and so we look at these individuals as they are someone's brother or sister or son or parent. And um, as, even though there's not a lot of money, uh, they are deserving of as much support as we can provide them to help them be successful. And I think that that's what we do every day is that we go into these, you know, Steve goes into the rooming houses and meets with folks and we work with um, property managers because you know, this is somebody's spouse, this is someone's parent. And, and, um, and they are having a hard time. And it is not easy living in a rooming house. Mm -hmm. You know, there are still rooming houses where it's the room and the shared bathroom and kitchenettes, and they're not all enhanced. And so, um, and how we can help them function as normally as possible every day. Um, I maintained so most all of them in Northampton for about 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. and so I, I, I know what you go through. I know the, the population, mm -hmm. difficult to house, to say the least. Um, and they all have issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be intimidating to look at. So I think that's a great thing. <laughs> when somebody opens the door, <laughs> there you are. But now that I've talked to you, I don't think I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> and you're smiling, so I think it's, uh, you probably fit the bill pretty well. And you were right, Peg. You were very right. <laughs> I'm intrigued with what your own preparation has needed to be in order to fulfill that function? Um, I think kind of along the lines of being very, very open to whatever is, you know, whatever is going to come about. Right. Um, not having any hesitations or reservations on what someone might say or whatever their situation is, they're, they're in and things like that. So. But you have to have a fairly comprehensive knowledge of what services are available, mm -hmm. right? Um, things that I, I, basically what I study at school, I've been out of school for a bit now, but mm -hmm. was sociology and mm -hmm. studying with and working for the uh, within a community. I worked for three years in Springfield as a case 
manager. So um, got to know a lot of the services that yeah. are and aren't there. Yeah. As well. Right. So it, I work with hospice, and I'm just curious about whether anybody in a single room occupancy status has been on a hospice care that you know of. Oh, yeah. We certainly do sense. provide hospice services to people I, in the world. I actually know of one particular instance Seven. personally. Really? A, a friend who, who had hospice care in his room. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. was, I had the feeling. It was, a VNA, it was a VNA hospice thing. It was, yeah. yeah. It does happen. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's, and, it and, and the fact that, um, you know, to have actually, to actually, because the challenge is double there, because in many cases in the hospice situation, in that respect, there's not family that will show up That's necessarily, right. and it's not necessarily the pla even an SRO that they may have been living in for years. It may not be the place you would consider home, but it's certainly not a hospital situation, and it is it's palliative care that I, I think the, um, it, this is the caveat we're giving with everybody that. Um, we have $161,000 worth of requests this year, and the, and the largesse from the feds is less than half of that. And in fact, it's reduced by a projected 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, we had $88,000 to award. This year, we have 79. And, it's, and as Councilor Casey has mentioned, that's over the last several years, that's the amount of 40% cut cumulatively. And it's in, 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 so we're, we're essentially a panel that's assembled to make paltry offers and awards and mm -hmm. so the concern here is that it, it, do you guys have a tipping point it, it, because is there a point that the award becomes too little to administer and deal with or is it is it more important to have a reflection of the community's commitment to the program to allow you to as you apply for other grants mm -hmm. No, that was just so. <laughs> 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 a loaded question. I'm trying to be as circumspect well, as possible. No, and I think that that's. I mean, I think that's more than fair. And I think you know we have um, our funding has been re reduced for the SRO throughout the years, and you know we ask for what we think we we need this year, and as I think we do every year, and and we make it work, and we make it work because it is the it's the the community support that is really important to us. We've been running this program since 1989, and um, right. And I, I don't see that we're willing to sort of say, well, if we don't get the money, then we're not going to. We're just going to, you know, reduce our time, and we're just not going to do that. We we figure it out. We, you know, we put a significant amount of our United Way funds goes to this program. We have the CDBG money. We have Valley CDC. We have some other smaller pots of money. We lost Highland Valley last year um, <clears throat> because they also had a reduction. Right. Uh, so we'll apply for that again and you know we're committed and Peg is committed to having a full-time person and so you know if we don't get what we've asked for um, as we have historically done we're going to figure it out because we think that this is a valuable service and I think the community finds it valuable. It, well, that, it, it's true, and that, I mean, the reason I set it up that way was that, um, and, and I had said this in the, in the other interview as well, is that the award is not representative of our esteem right. and our, how much we value the program. Right. And in fact, that's what makes us so painful because we feel, we feel like mooks while we do this. Mm -hmm. but, so, in fact, what we will what we will endeavor to do is try to find out the best, the, the, the largest amount that we can award that will work, mm -hmm. which we know in, in, in advance is going to be less than the request. Right. And that it's important that every agency that applies understands that this is not a reflection of uh, our dissatisfaction at any level and, and or our diminishing commitment to supporting particularly your agency, I mean, you know, SROs, as we said, with the diminishing <laughs> inventory and, di and, and, and di uh, thanks to Grover Northwest, among others, that the, 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 this, this culture of, of cutting social service programming and implying that pe 
people are takers yeah. instead of makers. Yeah. It just the, that whole culture just well makes me apoplectic. But the the fact mm -hmm. is that. We, it's very important that you understand that we do recognize and value the services that you, that you will be offering or are offering now and that, that and going going forward. So. Our hands are tied, and it's like every year what you're hearing, it just seems that it just decreases and decreases. And I want to thank you for all the work that you've done in the city a long time with the SROs. And does anybody else want to speak? Yeah, there was just in a little perspective over about nine years or so, the, um, the allotment actually dropped only about 10%. Yeah. And in the last three years alone, this would have lost that 40%. Yeah. So it, 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 the decrease has really accelerated in the last three years. Yeah. And we haven't got a clue as to where we're going. But you, I would think that your field is mostly is going to be common sense when you when you go to the door in an SRO. It's common sense and probably a lot of restraint and trying to figure out not to overreact or... Well, it gets every four a lot of people's skills. Yeah. yeah. It's every four, it's a lot of people's skills. Yeah. Common sense. Yeah. And, you know, being myself and just walking in. I think you have a tough job. Yes. I've been doing, I was over for many years and I think you have a tough job. I wish you all the luck in the world. It's, it's uh, common sense and humanity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. None of this makes any sense. This this paltry sums it doesn't make any sense to me. It takes special people to work with different types of people with different types of disabilities. We have so many agencies throughout this city, and all the employees are very valuable employees because they deal with people in need. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Jean. Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I conflated both your names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jane and Steve. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Jim, everyone. Jane, Dick, Thank you very much. See you, See you later. Bye. Nice, nice meeting you. you. Nice meeting you, too. Good luck. Thank you. He's going to do that. that. I'm sure you sure will. She had three things on. Jim, Jean, and Dick, and she gets so goddamn mad at all three of us. She goes, it's Jicky. Jicky. Perfect. Watch them all in the one. Very effective. Oh, boy. Did anybody, did anybody, is there a, did anybody sense any duplicacy or overlap in what they do, like for legal aid and things such as that in the direction? Well, here legal aid. I'm just, I'm just curious. You know, I legal aid know, supports. Legal aid is for people who are not necessarily in SROs, but uh, 